In today's session, we're going to talk about the measurement of cost behaviors. And so when we're finished, what we should be able to do is to explain management influences on cost behavior. We should be able to measure and mathematically express cost functions and use them to predict cost. We should be able to describe the importance of activity analysis for measuring cost functions. And we should be able to measure cost behavior using engineering analysis, high-low, visual fit, and least squares regression methods. So accountants and managers are often assumed that cost behaviors are linear over some relevant range of activity or cost drivers. We can graph these linear, relation, linear cost behavior relationships with a straight line because the relevant range specifies the interval of cost driver activity within which a specific relationship between a cost driver and its, or I'm sorry, between a cost and its driver will be valid. Managers usually define the relevant range based on their previous experience operating the organization at different levels of activity. So accountants often describe cost behaviors in visual or graphical terms. Exhibit 3.1 here shows linear, a linear cost behavior, the relevant range, and an activity or a resource cost driver. Note the similarity to this call of this to the cost volume profit graphs that we looked at in chapter two. So in addition to measuring and evaluating current cost behaviors, managers can influence cost behaviors through decisions about other factors such as product or service attributes, capacity, technology, and policies to create incentives to control costs. Throughout the value chain, managers influence cost behavior. This influence occurs through their choices of process and product design, quality levels, product features, distribution channels, and so on. Each of these decisions contributes to the organization's performance and managers should consider the costs and benefits of each decision. So capacity costs are the fixed cost of being able to achieve a desired level of production or to provide a desired level of service while maintaining product or service attributes such as quality. Most companies make a capacity decision infrequently. They consider capacity decisions as strategic because large amounts of resources are involved where these decisions come in. And an incorrect capacity decision can have serious consequences for the competitiveness of a company. Even if a company has chosen to minimize fixed capacity costs, every organization has some costs to which it is committed, perhaps for quite a few years. A company's committed fixed costs usually arise from the possession of facilities, equipment, and basic organizational structure. They may include items like mortgage or lease payments, interest payments, and long-term debt, property taxes, insurance, and salaries of key personnel. Some costs are fixed at certain levels only because management decided to incur these levels of costs to meet the organization's goals. These discretionary fixed costs have no obvious relationships to levels of capacity or output activity. Companies determine them as part of the periodic planning process. Each planning period, management would determine how much to spend on discretionary items such as advertising and promotion costs, public relations, research and development costs, charitable donations, employee training programs, and purchase management consulting services, to name a few. These costs then become fixed until the next planning period. So here's an example where Marietta Corporation is experiencing financial difficulties. Sales for its major products are down and Marietta's management is considering cutting back on costs temporarily. Marietta's management must determine which of these fixed costs it can reduce or eliminate and how much money each would save. So we see our fixed cost, the description, and then we see the planned amount, totaling $3.7 million. 
So can Marietta reduce or eliminate any of the fixed costs? The answer depends on the long run outlook. They could reduce costs, but also greatly reduce their ability to compete in the future if the costs are cut carelessly. Suppose rearranging these costs by categories of committed and discretionary costs yields the, this analysis. Eliminating all dis discretionary fixed costs would save Marietta $2.45 million per year. However, they might be, it might be unwise to cut all these discretionary costs completely. That could serious, severely impair the company's long-run prospectus and its future competitive position. Distinguishing committed and discretionary fixed costs would be the company's first step in identifying where costs could be reduced. So one of the most critical decisions that managers make is choosing the type of technology the organization will use to reduce its products or deliver its services. Choice of technology, for example, labor-intensive versus robotic manufacturing or personal banking services versus automated tellers or e-commerce versus in-store sales, right? So this choice of technology positions the organization to meet its current goals and to respond to changes in the environment. The use of high technology methods rather than labor usually means a much greater fixed cost component to the total cost. This type of cost behavior creates greater risk for companies with wide variations in demand. The incentives that management creates for employers can affect future cost. Or I'm sorry, the incentives that management creates for employees can affect future cost. Managers use their knowledge of cost behavior to set cost expectations, and employees may receive compensation or other rewards that are tied to meeting these expectations. For example, the administrator of Parkview Medical Center could give the supervisor of the facility's maintenance department a favorable evaluation if the supervisor maintained quality of service and kept department costs below the expected amount for the actual level of patient beds. This feedback motivates the supervisor to watch department costs carefully and to find ways to reduce costs without reducing quality of service. As a manager, you will use cost functions often as a planning and control tool. A few reasons why cost functions are important are listed here. Planning and controlling the activities of an organization require useful and accurate estimates of future fixed and variable costs. Understanding relationships between costs and their cost drivers allow managers in all types of organizations, whether they're profit-seeking, nonprofit, or government, to make better operating, marketing, and production decisions, to plan and evaluate actions, and to determine appropriate costs for short-term and long-run decisions. Cost measurement involves estimating or predicting costs as a function of appropriate cost drivers. And so understanding the relationships between costs and their cost drivers allows managers to make better operating, marketing, and production decisions, plan and evaluate action, and determine appropriate costs for short-term and long-term decisions. And so the first step in estimating or predicting cost is measuring cost behavior as a function of the appropriate cost drivers, and we talked about that earlier, right? The second step is to use these cost measures to estimate future costs at expected levels of cost driver activities. So this mixed cost function has the familiar form of a straight line. It's called a linear cost function. And all that we're saying here is that if we let y equal total cost, f is equal to the fixed cost, v is equal to the variable cost per unit, and x as the cost driver activity and number of units, that the mixed cost function, also called the linear cost function, is equal to total cost equaling fixed cost plus the variable cost per unit times the number of units involved. And that's the um, number of units for the cost driver of that variable cost per unit. So again, this is just a simple equation, and it creates this linear line, or linear cost function, represented by a linear, or for a, a line. The 
The cost function must be plausible or believable, right? Personal observations of costs and activities when it's possible provide the best evidence of a plausible relationship between a resource cost and its cost driver. In addition to being plausible, a cost function's estimates of cost at actual levels of activities must reliably conform to actual observed cost. We assess reliability in terms of goodness of fit, that is how well the cost function explains past cost behavior. If the fit is good and conditions do not change in the future, the cost function should be a reliable predictor of future cost. Managers use activity analysis to identify appropriate cost drivers and their effects on the cost of making a product or providing a service. The final product or service may have several cost drivers because production can involve many separate activities. The greatest benefit of activity analysis is that it directs management accountants to the appropriate cost drivers for each cost. So let's go through an example here. Northwest Computers makes two products, Mozart Plus and PowerDrive. In the past, most of the support costs were twice as much as labor costs. Northwest has upgraded the production function, which has increased support costs and reduced labor costs. So consider Northwest Computers, again we make, they make two products for personal computers, a plug-in music board, Mozart Plus, and a hard disk drive or power drive. These two products consist of material cost, labor cost, and support cost. In the past, most of the work on Northwest products was done by hand. In such a situation, labor costs were the primary driver of support cost. Support costs were twice as much as labor cost on average. Northwestern has just finished upgrading the production process. Now the company uses computer controlled assembly equipment, which has increased the cost of support activities such as engineering and maintenance and has reduced labor cost. Its cost function has now changed. Specifically, labor cost is now only 5% of the total cost at Northwestern. An activity analysis shown here shows that the number of components added to products as a measure of product complexity, not labor costs now, is the primary cost driver for the support function. So Northwestern has just finished upgrading the production process. Now the company uses computer controlled assembly equipment which has increased the cost of support activities such as engineering and maintenance and has reduced labor costs. Its cost function has now changed. Specifically, labor cost is now only 5% of the total cost at Northwestern. An activity analysis shown that the number of components added to, a, to products as a measure of product complexity, not labor cost, is the primary cost driver for support cost. Northwestern estimated support cost to be $20 per component. Mozart Plus has five component cost parts and PowerDrive has nine. And so after determining the most plausible drivers behind different costs, managers can choose from a broad selection of methods of appropriate approximating cost functions. These methods include engineering analysis, account analysis, high-low analysis, visual fit analysis, and least squares regression analysis. These measures or methods are not mutually exclusive. Managers frequently use two or more together to avoid major errors in measuring cost behavior. The first two methods rely primarily on logical analysis of the cost environment, whereas the last three involve explicit analysis of prior cost data. So let's talk first about engineering analysis. So engineering analysis measures cost behavior according to what costs should be in an ongoing process. It entails a systematic review of materials, supplies, labor, support services, and facilities needed for products and services. Analysts can even use engineering analysis successfully for new products and services as long as the organization has had experience with similar costs. And why is that? Well, it's because they can base measures on information from personnel who are directly involved with the product or services.
And so if we talk about account analysis now versus this engineering analysis, users of account analysis look to the accounting system for information about cost behavior. The simplest method of account analysis classifies each account as a variable or fixed cost with respect to selected cost drivers. The cost analyst then looks at each cost account activity and estimates whether the variable cost per unit of cost driver activity or periodic fixed cost. To illustrate the approach to account analysis, return, let's return to the facilities maintenance department at Parkview Medical Center and analyze costs for a recent month. And so what we see here is a description of what the monthly cost is. Is it supervisor salary and benefits? Is it the hourly workers' wages and benefits? Is it equipment repairs or cleaning supplies? And so we have a total amount in the first column, which totals to $37,423. We've decided that um, there is a fixed component or there are two fixed items, supervisor salaries and benefits and equipment depreciation and rentals, and the rest are variable costs. So measuring total facilities maintenance cost behavior then requires only simple arithmetic. First, add up all the fixed costs to get the total fixed cost per month, which we said was $9,673. Then divide the total variable cost by the units of cost driver activity to get the variable cost per unit of each month. And so we said that the variable costs were $27,750 divided by 3,700 patient days, or we get $7.50 per patient day of variable cost. And if we use our linear equation, then total cost is equal to the fixed plus the variable times the cost driver of which equals 9673 plus 750 times the patient days to get to Y. So when sufficient cost data is available, the cost analyst may use historical data to measure the cost function mathematically. The simplest of the three methods to measure a linear cost function from past cost data is the high-low method. And so after selecting the representative high and low points, we can draw a line between them, extending the line to the vertical y-axis of the graph. Note that this extension in Exhibit 3-4 is a dashed line. As a reminder, that cost may not be linear outside the range of activity for which we have data which we referred to previously as a relevant range. Also, managers usually are concerned with how costs behave within the relevant range, not with how they behave either at zero activity or at impossibly high activity levels. Measurements of costs within the relevant range may not be reliable measures or predictors of costs outside the relevant range. The point at which the line intersects the y-axis is the intercept F, or estimate of fixed cost, because that's saying that at zero number of patient days or zero units of production, the, there would still be some certain level of fixed cost, and in this case the intercept or F is $7,270, which what this says is that we would have that level of cost if we had zero patient days. So the slope of the line measures the variable cost. And so what is the variable cost? And in using algebra to solve for variable and fixed costs, we see that variable cost equals the change in cost divided by the change in activity. And to that end, using our previous example, we have the $47,000 minus $17,000 divided by the 4,900 patient days minus the 1,200 patient days, which gets us to a variable cost component of $8.10 or $0.11 approximately per patient day. Then we ask, what is the fixed cost? Well, the fixed cost is equal to the total mixed cost, mixed cost defined as variable and fixed, minus the total variable cost. And when we, once we've gotten to that point, um, we get to say that, well, at x high, f is equal to 47,000 minus the $8.11 times the 4,900 patient days, which gets us to 72.70 a month, or at x low, the fixed cost is equal to 17,000 
uh, dollars, which is simply equal to the eight dollars and eleven cent times the twelve hundred patient days, and that again gets us to the seventy-two seventy a month. And so for our fourth example or method, um, we talk about this visual fit method. And here we draw a straight line through a plot of all the available data using judgment to fit the line as close as possible to all the plotted points. If the cost function for the data is linear, it is possible to draw a straight line through the scattered points that comes reasonably close to most of them and thus captures the general tendency of the data. We can extend that line back until it intercepts the vertical axis of the graph, which again gets us to our fixed cost. And so finally we move on to the last method that we talked about, and that's this least squares regression or simple regression analysis. And this measures a cost function more objectively and explicitly than does the visual fit method. Least squares regression analysis uses statistics rather than human eyesight to fit a cost function to all the historical data. A simple regression uses one cost driver to measure a cost function, while a multiple regression uses two or more cost drivers. In this session, we're going to only discuss a simple regression analysis. And these can become very complicated, complex statistical measures. Um, but I think it's helpful for us to have a little bit of background on this because it does, this method still continues to come up in business and certainly in your statistics classes and in other um, uh, examples throughout your business studies. And so regression analysis measures cost behavior more reliably than other data-based cost measurement methods. It also yields important statistical information about the reliability of its cost estimates. These statistics allow analysts to assess their confidence in the cost measures and thereby select the best cost driver. One such measure of reliability, also thought of as goodness of fit, is the coefficient of determination, which we statistically represent as R2 or R squared. This measures how much of the function of a cost is explained by changes in the cost driver. This exhibit shows the linear mixed cost function for facilities maintenance cost as measured mathematically by regression analysis. The fixed cost measure is $9,329 per month. The variable cost measure is $6.95 I'm sorry, $6.95 per patient day, again using least squares regression method. Regression analysis measures cost behavior more reliably than any other cost measurement method. It also yields important statistical information about the reliability of its cost estimates. These statistics allow analysts to assess their confidence in the cost measures and thereby select the best cost driver. One such measure of reliability, which we've also referred to as goodness of fit, is this coefficient of determination which measures how much of the fluctuation of a cost is explained by drivers in the cost driver, or by changes in the cost driver. And so this concludes Chapter 3. Um, I would go back and uh, reread the text as usual. Please do not let these our discussions and um, presentations um, substitute as reads of the chapter. And then please move on to the learning exercises and the um, discussion forums. And thanks very much.